It is wonderful to see young people saying that, hey, the Martin comes to me, my life is in your hands. I thank God for uh, young people today and for the contribution that they are making to this church. Let's give them another round of applause. This morning, you will find me in St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, and verse 1 will be my text this morning. And it is really great to hear them saying, you know, my life is in your hands, because it, it, it kind of lined up with what I want to say today. And the text read in verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've chosen for my topic this morning, today, let not your heart be troubled. Bow with me in a word of prayer at this time. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day of worship, thanksgiving, and praise. I thank you that I can be here among church family to worship you, O God, because you are worthy of worship, adoration, and praise. And today, Father, on this Youth Sunday, I thank you that I can be here, O God, and play a small part within this act of worship. I ask your blessings, O God, upon this congregation, and upon, O God, the hearers of your word today, as we, O oh God, sit in your presence to fellowship and to give you thanks, praise, and all the glory. I pray that as I stand here today before your people, that you will speak to me, O oh God, and speak through me. I pray that self will decrease and that the Holy Spirit will increase. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable within thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. The Apostle John, a Galilean fisherman, brother of James, son of Zebedee, an author of the gospel, bearing his name, spoke about four troubled things. In St. John chapter 5, beginning from verse 1, he spoke about the troubled water. There was a pool in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. It had five porches or doorways, and in Hebrew, it's called Bethesda, and was surrounded by five covered columns called colonnades, which was a room of columns. Here lay a great number of sick folks, disabled people, some blind, some crippled, and some paralyzed. But they all had one thing in common at the poolside. They were there at the pool of Bethesda, waiting for the bubbling up of the water. For the scripture said that an angel of the Lord went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. And whoever stepped in first, after the stirring up of the water, was cured of, of whatever diseases they had. But a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years and could not make it ahead of others into the pool. When Jesus saw him lying there helpless, knowing that he had been in this condition, for a very long time said unto him, Do you want to get well? But the impotent man did not know who 
Jesus was. All he knew is that if he could get into the pool first, after the angel of the Lord stirs up the water, he would be healed of his affliction. He did not say, heal me Lord, because he did not know or knew who Jesus was. Like some of us today, he put his faith in things which were made by God rather than to put his faith in God who had created all things. God created the heavens and the earth and he should be placed first in our lives and above all the things that we admire. But we can excuse the impotent man because he did not know who Jesus was at that moment. But we, as church folks, know who Jesus is and what he can do for us. We have the Holy Bible, 66 books at our disposal. If we take time out to read it, we can learn a great deal about Jesus and his love for us. We are living in what is called an age of information. We have the radio programs, television programs, where the gospel is proclaimed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We also have the internet and the social media that gives us access to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. We know who Jesus is. And without and we are without excuse if we do not have some measure of faith in Jesus Christ, God's Son. Jesus had to approach this man in order to heal him because he was not looking for Jesus. He was looking for the pool of Bethesda so that he can enter into this pool and be healed. And so when the great physician showed up, he did not know or recognize who the great physician was. And as this man told Jesus, I have no one when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. Jesus said to him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was healed and made whole. He took up his bed and he walked. Later on, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Say no more. Let something worse happen to you. And secondly, in John 11, chapter 11 and verse 33, the author of John spoke about the troubled spirit. As we know, in John chapter 11, Jesus' friend Lazarus had died. And when Jesus saw Mary and the Jews who came with her to Lazarus' tomb, weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The shortest verse in the Bible said that Jesus wept. When you are troubled in spirit, that is something that will happen naturally when you lose a loved one. When Mary and Martha, his friends, wept over the death of their brother Lazarus, Jesus felt their pain 
He was not only God, he was also human. He knew what they were going through because he came to this earth in human flesh. He knew what it means to feel sorrow and pain or to experience the death of a loved one. Jesus felt the loss and the pain of Mary and Martha after their brother Lazarus had died and was put inside the tomb. And so Jesus wept with them. Jesus, he was just as much shown as they were. Therefore he groaned in himself as he approached Lazarus' grave. The Jews said, see how he loved them. Can you imagine the creator of heaven and earth weeping at the tomb of a person who was made by his own hands. Yes. Isn't that love? Yes. The creator of the heavens and earth loved and cared so much for his friends and followers that he is touched deeply when they are grieving or in sorrows. Yes. Wherever you feel pain, God feels your pain. When you mourn the death of a loved one, God mourns with you. Yes. You see, we are in Christ. And as Jesus said, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and I am in you. So that there is one. When one rejoice, all rejoice. When one is sad, all will be sad. But as we know, the death of a loved one is a part of life. We realize that life is not a bed of roses. Man that is born of woman will be of a few days and of many sorrows. We will have troubles and trials. We will experience the death of a loved one from time to time. But if we trust in God, He will see us through every bad situation which we are facing. God cares about His children and will never forsake them in spite of what the world says about them. We know that one day, if our loved ones die in Christ, that they will rise again. Because Jesus said that I am the life and I am the resurrection. If we believe and we die in Christ, we one day will rise again. Our loved ones one day will rise again. Whatever you're going through, God will be there Amen. to go through it with you. And we must realize that if Jesus was troubled in spirit while he was on this earth, and he was just here for about 33 and a half years, but some of us are living past 33 and a half years. So we know what it feels like to be troubled in spirit. Jesus experienced some of the things that we felt, that we feel from time to time. And so we have a Savior who can identify with what we are going through. The good news is that God is with us when we are in distress. He may not save you from a fiery trial, but God will stand with you in the fire. He will never abandon you when you are going through a tough situation. We must realize that God is only a prayer away. As a church, we should be a praying people. It should be natural.
to pray to God when disaster strikes. Yeah. For the God that we serve, he is not far away. He is just a prayer away. And when we are facing problems in our lives, all we have to do is say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No matter help I know, if thou wouldst draw thyself from me, where shall I go? There is no need to worry or to be anxious. There is no need to fret when the enemy is on your track. Because the God that you serve, he never failed you yet. I know that my God has never failed me yet. What he has done for others, God can also do it for you. But you must trust him. Let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in Jesus. Because Jesus, he loves you and he cares for you. We do not know the future. Who will be the next victim of a crime report? The next traffic fatality? Or where the next disaster will take place? We do not know that. All we know as a church and a praying people is that if God, who God keeps, is well kept. Right. And that if God be for you, who can be against you? And I'm sure that the present crime problems in our country has caused us to be troubled in spirit. I know that my spirit is troubled when you hear the crime reports, when you hear about man's inhumanity to man. As a people, we do not like what is happening on our streets or in our neighborhoods. We want to see a change taking place and peace on our streets. But we have to work hand in hand with our government and the law enforcement officers to bring about some kind of changes in this country. All of us have a role to play to bring a change in this Bahama land. When good things happen, we can rejoice and celebrate. But oh, when bad things happen, it robs us of our joy. It takes away the joy that is in our spirit. It causes the human spirit to be troubled when all you can hear is bad news. But all is not lost in spite of what is happening in this country. We still have some good young children. We still have some good, decent, honest men and women inside of this country. In spite of what is going on, all is not lost. We have a hope. And our hope is in Christ Jesus, who said to us, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. And whatever you shall ask in Jesus' name, he will do it. But we must ask him in faith. And we must work together as a people to make this country a better country. Because you know when you hear about the reports, the, the bad reports, it causes you pain. It may not be your child that was murdered or slain, but it causes you pain. You feel it because you are a human being. When you hear the bad report, it causes unrest. It causes you to be upset in your spirit because as a decent moral citizen, you do not like what is happening inside of your country. And whatever way, the trouble may come. God wants to know that he will go through it with us. We do not have to go through it alone. We know that many mothers are grieving the death of their children. Some die at a very young age. Some live to be 50 plus years. But nobody knows like a mother knows 
when a child is slain on the street. And so the mother would become troubled in her spirit whenever she loses her loved one. Also in John 13, Jesus was troubled in spirit as he told his disciples that one of you is going to betray me. He knew that Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, would betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And eventually, he would die a cruel death on a wooden cross. And so, Jesus voluntarily suffered and died because it was the only way to save the human race from a place called hell. And nothing has changed on our street. Men are still betraying one another. Men are still backstabbing <coughs> one another. They would sit down, eat and drink together and turn around and plan the death of the person they just had a drink with or a meal. Because they need a change of heart. Men need Jesus to come into their lives to give them a change of heart. Their soul is troubled. Because the soul of God is a troubled soul. The soul is speaks about your mind, your will, and your emotion. Have you ever met a person whose soul was troubled? Sometimes it could be in a good way. Jesus' soul was troubled because something bad was about to happen to him. We know how it feels when something terrible is going to happen to us. You get a bad feeling. You feel sad and want desperately to escape what is about to happen to you. Jesus could have prayed, Father, save me from what is about to happen. But for that reason, he came into the world to die on the cross, to fulfill, to fulfill the scripture, to be betrayed, to die for the sins of mankind. Because mankind cannot save his own soul. Jesus' soul was troubled because he had to die a painful death. But think about it. What if he had called for 10,000 angels to save him? There would not be no Easter or Resurrection Day to celebrate. What if Jesus had called for 10,000 angels to save him? from dying a cruel death on the cross. Our preaching would be in vain. When we say that he rose again from the dead, it would not be true. Our saying would all be in vain. But thank God that Jesus rose again from the dead. Even though his soul was troubled at one time, his spirit was troubled at another time, he stayed focused and kept his eyes upon the cross so that he could die to save you and me. Yes. And we know the end of the story, that Jesus triumph, was triumphant and he rose victoriously over the grave. He overcome hell and the grave. He triumphed over death. Jesus is an example for us to follow. Wherever we have a troubled spirit or a troubled soul. We must keep focus. We must keep our eyes on the work that God has called us to do. Yes. The devil has a job to do. And that is to take you away from the work of God. But we are not about to let that happen. No matter how much discouragement comes our way, no matter how much pain and sorrow we may experience. We will be like Jesus and trust in God to stand with us as we go through our troubles 
and on trial. Jesus did not try to escape when God wanted him to go through. God had a plan for Jesus to die on the cross to save mankind. Jesus just kept the faith and that his father would raise him up from the dead. Whenever the scripture had prophesied about Jesus, it all took place. It said that he would die on, on a cross, and he did die on the cross. The scripture said that on the first day of the week, um, he rose again from the dead, and he did rose again from the dead. Today, Jesus' tomb is empty, because after three days, as the scripture said, the stone was rolled away, and Jesus walked out of that tomb. Death could not hold your Savior and my Savior down. He was victorious over that tomb. And fourthly, the author of John chapter 14 and verse 1, the author says, he speaks about the troubled heart. From time to time, our hearts become troubled. They become sad. They become weary. But Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You see, the apostles, when Jesus said that I just received some disturbing news, Jesus foretold his death, and he was about to leave them after a while. But Jesus wanted to comfort them because he had to go back to his Father in heaven after his work here on earth was completed. Jesus knew that as human beings, they would be troubled in spirit and soul. And when he leave them, when he leave them to return to heaven, they would be troubled because they spent many years with Jesus, walking with him, talking with him, observing his miracles, and they had a special bond. And so Jesus did not want his disciples' heart to be troubled. Just as he doesn't want your heart and my heart to be troubled. Because he may not be here physically, but he is here with us in spirit. Yes. He didn't want them or even us to feel abandoned after his work on earth was completed. Jesus did not want them to feel like orphans or to be comfortless. And so he gave them words of encouragement. Let not your heart be troubled. You see, death does not have the final word over Jesus. But whatever you believe, whatever you believe that God can do, God will do it for you. Once you come to Jesus, once you come in Jesus' name. As we know, Jesus went to prepare a place and he said that he would come again and he would receive us once again to be with him. But while you wait for him to come back, he encouraged us to love one another as he has loved us. He encouraged us 